You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock. Welcome to In Pursuit of Development. Today we're exploring the globalization of finance. And my guest is Dida Kuralt, an assistant professor of political science at Yale University who studies historical causes of modern day fiscal institutions. We begin by examining the multifaceted role of aid, loans and investments in global development. It is particularly concerning that an increasing number of countries are struggling with rising debt and facing defaults. A recent World Bank report revealed that developing countries paid a record $443.5 billion in 2022 to service their public debts, a situation exacerbated by surging global interest rates and a strong US dollar. This debt servicing cost represents a 5% increase from the previous year, with warnings of more challenges ahead for the world's poorest nations. Therefore, it is crucial to gain a deeper understanding of which forms of globalized finance are more effective in fostering development. Our second segment focuses on DDAC's prize-winning book, Pawn States, State Building in the Era of International Finance, which examines the consequences of early access to external finance for long-term state capacity. In the 19th century, developing countries frequently sought loans from European credit houses to manage their finances and cope with war. While this external financing provided opportunities for growth, it often allowed leaders of these borrower states to skip essential steps in developing institutions and making their political systems more inclusive. Didac's book illustrates how this reliance on early foreign loans has resulted in persistent fiscal instability and diminished governmental effectiveness in the developing world. As the consequences of this financial globalization for newly formed and traditionally isolated countries, including Latin American and Asian nations, were profound, Didac and I discussed the borrower motives, the impact of long maturity periods, and the uniformity of interest rates despite varying economic economic situations. We also touch upon the extreme conditionalities imposed by foreign lenders, the practice of gunboat diplomacy, and the repercussions of defaults, including the foreclosure of public assets. Towards the end of our conversation, we also explore how external finance has impacted state building with a special focus on success stories like Japan and Chile and contrasting these with the experiences of countries like Argentina and Ethiopia. We also consider the following broader questions. Why did public debt not always aid state building in the global south? What role did political polarization, corruption and innovation play in state building? And how did foreign lending ultimately weaken nations? We appreciate the positive feedback many of you have shared with us in recent weeks. Your comments and suggestions are invaluable and play a key role in enhancing our show. We encourage you to keep sending your thoughts and ideas via email or through our social media channels. Thank you. Didak, we finally meet. It's about time. Congratulations on a fantastic book and welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I want to start talking a little bit about, you know, how the world looks today, Didak. When you think about, when you open the newspaper, when you read about anything related to global development, one of the things that people talk about is finance. They're talking about loans, high interest rates. I was reading a report by the World Bank recently that a lot of low-income countries have really struggled to pay. I think it's like over $440 billion to just service their loans. So there's considerable talk about debt trap diplomacy, private sector lending, but also governments providing foreign aid, loans, you name it. And this is causing quite a lot of problems around the world. But the intention on paper appears to be to help people living in poverty, improve social protection, build infrastructure, but the reality seems to be a bit more mixed. So in your view, having studied this, at least the history of this globalization of finance, are there certain types you think of global finance that may be more beneficial to promoting development than others? 
So my, my sense is that countries that have debt or issued debt from official sources are in relatively good hands. So I don't see rationale to make money out of those loans in, in those kind of uh, transactions. We might disagree on the conditionality that those loans have and also on on basically the the fine the fine print of those of those loans, but I think that the intention is positive. A different story is about private lending, which today is a relatively smaller share of the the market than it was in the past. That it was in particular in the period of time that I study in the book. And we also should be cautious about what's going on with loans from, from China. And I, I also want to be cautious in, in referring to this particular topic. It's a hot topic in, in the discipline. And I want to be cautious because we have very little information about what those loans imply, what the terms are. And it is easy to end up thinking that we are in a broke diplomacy or debt trap environment. It might be the case, but it might it might not because we don't actually know what's what's going on in in, the, in those loans. So we live in a in a very special time in times in which sovereign debt is is increasing, not only external debt but also domestic debt. And I think that particularly in political science, we have to put way more attention on the political implications of having this basically a resource to fund public spending locally. And also we have to be more aware of what are the consequences of, of defaulting or avoiding avoiding default. I think that's, that the discipline still has to catch up. There are too many questions to be addressed. I know. I mean, there are lots of issues going on, but you know, this debate is extremely polarized because I myself have done work on China and Africa. And uh, when you look at the evidence, at least presented by some, I mean, you, you I know you know Axel Dreher's work. Mm-hmm. He's been on the show, Deborah Brottingham and others. In fact, most people working, say, on China and Belt and Road would say it isn't anything to do with debt trap. But the, the narrative in Washington really has promoted this. And most China experts would say this is not correct. Going back to the larger issue of development finance, a lot of countries, low-income countries, uh, would say we need more money. There's just not enough because there's there's so much that we can do. We have a young population. We have natural resources, but we need finance. And it has to be at low interest rates, concessional lending. And sometimes it is very, you know, difficult if you think about the kind of investments one requires for climate change, uh, adaptation, et cetera, or just to construct a solar plant. The money that is available to European countries is so much cheaper in terms of interest rates than to the countries that are really poor. It's like a puzzle that there is money in the system, but somehow it does not seem to reach those countries that really need them. And, and that, that I think, is really a big challenge. Yes, absolutely. And I think that a lot more can be done. At the same time, I want to emphasize the impact that external finance has on the incentives of, of incumbents. And I think that in designing financial assistance to countries, we, we need to incorporate those insights in political science and try to condition access to external finance to things that promote political accountability. And that's very delicate because that might violate political sovereignty. But I think that the more that we can do to make sure that politicians have to be responsible in spending the the money, that they have to basically incorporate civil society and also main economic players in designing and implementing these programs in in order to make sure that the money is well spent and is not basically deviated for things that are not related to development and are not used for purely electoral or political ends. We need to basically bring all these things that we know in political science and try to make conditionality that's, that, that speaks to that. And that's very difficult, but, but we need to do it. And, and what it's important is to know that possibly there is no one policy that fits all countries, that all this conditionality has to be very specific to the local conditions, have to understand what are the political institutions and how this inflow of external money might affect the incentives there. And, and that's why I think we have to be super careful and avoid stereotypes and avoid basically pretend that there are solutions that work in every environment. 
But I think it's very important to understand that external finance changes those incentives to basically get reelected and investing in fiscal capacities in order to repay that, that debt. I think the key word here is conditionality. And, you know, mm-hmm. in the development discourse, the role of the World Bank, especially the IMF, is often highlighted because if you remember, there was this period of structural adjustment and a lot of countries were asked to tighten up their budgets and the expenses because the IMF is saying basically, you know, there has to be some conditions that we impose for fiscal stability. You can't have too many sort of uh, expenditures on expensive social protection programs. You have to cut down, you know, your stuff. You can't use $110 if you only earn $100. So it was basically that. But that led to a lot of dissatisfaction. And as you said, a lot of countries felt that their sovereignty was at stake. It's, it's, it is almost <laughs> like this kind of advice is just infringing on a government's ability to deliver development. So when you think a little bit about the current international financial architecture, Didak, and particularly the role of the IMF and the kind of conditionalities that it imposes i'm thinking about any country zambia which which you know had a problem defaulted or if you think about argentina the kind of upheaval that it is you know going through how do you think the imf has performed its function because imf is not trying to make a profit so it is trying to govern the system but then there are these trade offs that that come about in terms of sovereignty etc yeah, so th- that's that's a super hard question because my, my point is that one has to be a specialist in those particular countries to actually propose a meaningful solution. My take here is that both parts need to sit down and to make sure that, that the solutions don't involve an extremely anti-redistributive solution that, for instance, everything that I've heard about how Argentina, the, the new ministry, minister of Argentina is addressing this uh, restructuring involves basically cutting on, on the on the poor, right? So if, if the poor are going to feel the, the biggest uh, hit. They always do. I mean, the hardest hit they, are always the poor. Yes. So so I think that's, that's precisely where the IMF and other international institutions have to come in and, and to make sure that the readjustment cost is split, that, that the elites and those that are in a better financial position also contribute to this readjustment. I don't know the particulars of the case, but we need to also deal with issues about international taxation, about uh, movements yes. of capital, right? Uh, to make sure that everybody assumes the, the cost of readjustment, which is probably necessary, right? But there are ways to do it. And that's why one needs to pay attention to detail. One needs to pay attention to the local institutions and to propose a readjustment that that anticipates how local players, how the local elites, how the local government are going to react to that readjustment. So basically the IMF has to anticipate the ways in which the powerful are going to try to dodge the bullet and basically pass the burden of of readjustment to to the poor who basically have no way to escape those costs, right? So that's basically the what, what I'm advocating for is, is a philosophy, a, a rational of how we should think about readjustment and about how international institutions cope with those difficulties which exist. And I basically leave it to the experts, to the IMF, to identify the best, the best solution. I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in Argentina nowadays or in Zambia nowadays. I see from the past that there were solutions that were clearly suboptimal. And what I'm advocating for is to is to basically think of, of these programs in a more comprehensive way that not only addresses the economic consequences, but also the political incentives. The trouble with these prescriptions is that it is sometimes difficult to know beforehand how it'll hit different sections of the population. There are lots of things we don't know. And so the IMF's advice that may sound or look good today may prove to be wrong or <laughs> inadequate, you know, five years down the line. But I'm glad you mentioned taxation because I know you're also interested in that aspect. Mm-hmm. As you know, there's quite a lot of discussion on not just, you know, getting uh, external finance, but domestic mo- revenue mobilization, right? And mm-hmm. and this is really something that, I mean, like the Nordic countries, you know, when we talk about development, we're giving this advice to, to low-income countries. It's all about taxation, you know, the how to get domestic revenue um, mobilized substantially to offset this kind of reliance on international finance. But I find that one thing is to design a perfect tax system. 
<laughs> and then to implement it is a challenge, as you said, because there's always going to be some people pushing back, especially if you are hardest hit. And then there is this whole challenge of who to tax, because you're talking about, you know, economies where there's a lot of informality. You don't really know who to tax. Maybe it's agriculture sector, which is the big thing. And it's, and it's difficult sometimes to get an overview. And then you have all these tax breaks. You mentioned also the international taxation. You have multinational companies oh, coming in. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, getting all these benefits, but not really paying. And so you begin to wonder, you know, even with all of these advanced and very well thought of, well intentioned uh, taxation regimes, is domestic mobilization really being revved up? I'm not so sure that many countries are really doing a good job. It seems almost like, and we'll soon get to the, the heart of the argument in your book, it almost seems like local elites, including political elites, find it a lot easier to ask and request for international finance than to do the heavy lifting of generating, mobilizing domestic revenue. I don't know what you think. Yes, no, it, it, it is very hard. And, and sometimes we just think that by adopting a new tax or by raising the, the rates, things are going to change. When most of the times what, what these countries need is to invest in legibility and actually know who has what. And like investing in cadastres, for instance, it's, it's, it's fundamental. And I would basically do what the West did before the 19th century. Some of these societies are not as monetarized as, as the West, and maybe you need to rely more on excises. Uh, you need to rely more on VAT. And I know it's very unpopular these days, but I think that one of the poorest decisions that were made under the Washington consensus is, was to basically liberalize trade and, and drop all these tariffs, which were the main sources of revenue in the developing world. I think that what we have to do is to basically go back to basics, to the drawing table to see and to and to adopt policy and, and, and recommend policy that is equipped to economies that are not as sophisticated as the West. I mean, an income tax in, an, in a poor country is going to do very little for two reasons. There are very few, few people that could actually, that qualify to pay for that tax. And also it is a very hard tax to implement. So unless you have a, a sophisticated tax administration, in which basically the, the income is with, withhold automatically and you need some sophisticated software that, that does that. that. I mean, that's not going to move the needle in a developing world. Probably you need to invest in excise collectors, for instance, value the tax collectors. You might want to come back a little bit uh, to raise a little bit the, the export taxes, things that, you know, are going to increase the revenue. And I think that those, are, those solutions exist and have existed for centuries. And I think it's, it's, it's the way to go. I'm not saying that we have to go back to a protectionist world, but this idea that free trade is going to solve everything, I think that it has been very well proven that that's not the case. When you were just mentioning legibility, cadastres, et cetera, taxation, I was thinking about my friend and mentor, Jim Scott at Yale, you know, uh, seeing like the state or how people flee from the state. So let's get into this, um, the business of state building. Now, something remarkable happened in, was it 1815? Was it before 1789, the international capital market? as you write in your book, was centered in Amsterdam. And yes. it was catering to European countries. But in 1815 and later on, there was a major change. So London then becomes the financial capital. And some of it is, of course, because of the Industrial Revolution, more money in the system. You know, London is the center of the world at that in that period. And what happens is that the international financial system then, or the Western international system, increases. We are not just talking about European countries. We're talking about newly created countries. We're talking about colonies and countries that were rather isolated from the international system. And suddenly, you had a lot of private capital being available to this new group of countries. For what purpose? Tell us a little bit. So you have a totally new system. A lot of money is coming in. A lot of countries are borrowing money. Was it to build infrastructure? Was it to finance wars? Was it to provide food for their people? What happened following 1815? 
So what happened is that many uh, many of these new countries and historically isolated countries has put forward programs of state building. They saw that the euro basically was was rising and, and they had to catch up. A lot of this money is invested in building new militaries, in modernizing the militaries, and, and that involves buying weapons from, from the Europeans at a price. So that was the largest chunk. As the 19th century moves on, there is a lot of investment in railroads. I'm happy to tell you what I think about, about that investment. And eventually, a lot of loans are floated to finance old loans. Those are like the three main pieces, the three main lines of spending. International finance was not meant to, to basically grow the welfare state or uh, provide relief to the, to the poor. How effective was this finance to buy weapons, to pay off debts, to build infrastructure? Were there some countries that were better able to use this money than others? And if so, what explains that relative success? Yes, so it was effective in the sense that they bought a lot of materials, like the Ottoman Empire, they they built an amazing fleet. But it it always depended on receiving more uh, like ammunition and new stuff from the West. Chinese also tried to build a new military, but there there were so many things going on in China, civil war, that basically it was really hard to build anything sustainable in China. The Japanese were very good in modernizing their, their military. And in Latin America, basically all the major countries in Latin America invested in, in building their armies. Now, war is not particularly productive. It can be good if war is financed with, with taxes because that builds capacity and we go back to the Belize's hypothesis. What I argue in the book is that that didn't happen very often because rather than raising taxes, many of these countries funded war externally and eventually they defaulted and they swapped war debt for control over sources of, of revenue. The second part is that debt was invested in, the, the loans were invested in, in building railroads. And some of these railroads proved to be very effective in increasing the GDP of the country, like Mexico and Brazil and Argentina. They have shown that they were good in promoting economic growth, but not even in those three countries and not in the vast majority of countries in the 19th century. Railroad created what economic historians call backward linkages, meaning that it's not only about growing the, the pie right, of, of the economy, but it's also about creating these secondary industries that basically grow the tax base of the country. What happened with railroads in the 19th century, the vast majority of countries in the world, is that it was meant to, it was meant as an extractive mechanism. So the British investors, the German investors would connect the mine to the, to the port. And basically that railroad would increase the size of the, the pie because it would create wealth. But that wealth did not stay in the countries. That wealth was repatriated to the West, right? That it didn't create this backward linkage that should be conducive to economic economic growth. And there is a, a beautiful a beautiful book by John Godsworth, who basically has analyzed the impact of railroads in Mexico. And he has this very I, I think it was it is even in the in the title of, of the book that it's called Economic Growth and Underdevelopment. It tells this story that railroads were good in bringing external finance to Mexico, in basically increasing the revenue, presumably, that should go to the to the coffers of the Mexican state, but it didn't because that revenue went back to basically the Euro, European countries, right? So it, it actually amplified inequalities. It kind of plundered natural resources from Mexico rather than creating wealth in Mex- for Mexico. You know, I'm thinking if I was one of those leaders, suddenly with access to international finance, I would jump at that opportunity, right? I mean, I haven't had this opportunity. I was excluded from the that so-called Western international system. Now I can invest in railroads. I can invest in anything, roads, bridges, mm-hmm. uh, and of course, uh, you know, modernize the military, pay the soldiers more money. So this is great. Now, the trouble is my ability to pay back mm-hmm. because my economy is weak. I'm not sure whether I can actually pay back these very, very expensive loans. Mm-hmm. But I always have an excuse. I know that I won't be around 
for the 30 years that this loan is supposed to mature, right? Mm -hmm. so it's a long-term loan. Mm -hmm. I can offset this. I can make sure that others who come after me 15, 20 years later will take all the blame or, you know, will face the consequences. At the moment, I want something visible. I, you know, I want to be popular. I can give something tangible to my people. Yes. So I, I, I understand like the motives from the borrower side, but what I think is a puzzle and you do a very good job in the book is to really explain how these lenders are providing expensive loans to countries that may not be able to pay back and will most likely default. So tell us a little bit about the strategies that the lenders undertook to offset these huge risks of giving money to regions of the world where, you know, you don't really expect to get the money back. Yes. So that's because the book covers over 100 years. The mechanisms that lenders had evolved over time and they evolved in response to the many episodes of default that actually uh, happened. So what I argue is that in the second half of the 19th century, the, the bondholders, they were bond I mean, funny investors in, in Paris and also in, in, in Germany, but it was London, basically the, the, the capital of, of finance in the world. So what they did is they put together the corporation of foreign bondholders. So this was, this was an organization, a private organization that brought together the big bondholders and the small bondholders. The big bondholders were the banks themselves that were basically selling the stock in, in London. And they have an incentive to be very understanding with, with default episodes because they wanted to keep the business going. They wanted to sign new contracts with the borrowers. So on the one hand, you have these people and, and then you have the small investors, regular individuals who wanted to be very tough with, with the borrowers. They wanted to get their savings back. So they come together and basically they, they are better in negotiating the strategy via v, the, the borrowers. Uh, who were in default. That's one thing. They, they gained this collective action, this organizational structure and capacity, and now they start to lobby the foreign office for, for diplomatic assistance. And the foreign office in, in the UK also changed their attitude towards international default. So I think it was in 1949, 1849 or 46, the Palmerston Doctrine, basically established that the UK, the government, would stay away from episodes of international default, that they would not support private investors because of those were private contracts. And they understood the moral hazard problem of basically always supporting the borrowers that, because that would lead to a more aggressive and risky investment. Now, that doctrine is progressively relaxed over time for two reasons. The first one is that there is this substitution in who runs the exchequer, who runs the Bank of England, and who populates the diplomatic corpus in the, in the UK. The aristocracy in the UK had usually based their well-being on the productivity of land, but after the repeal of the, the Corn Laws in the 1840s, land loses a lot of its economic productivity, and there is this gradual shift in the professional careers of the aristocracy. And what they do is that they occupy leading positions in the financial sector in London, but they also move to work within the exchequer, the foreign office, the diplomatic body, and the Bank of England. So there is this quasi-natural alignment of financial and national interests that make the lobbying of the Corporation of Foreign Bondholders more appealing to these people because they were basically, this was a very tight elite that went to the same clubs, that went had gone to the same, basically, schools. And they were very responsive. And basically, this has been studied by economic historians like Keynes and Hopkins, like Cassis and sociologists like Scott. Basically, they have created all these networks that shows that how embedded they were. Now, there is this third element, which is a changing geopolitical... Uh, um, 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 the great power competition. Yes. So we have to, we have to understand that two-thirds two -thirds of all British capital was invested overseas. And uh, the French and the Germans in the second half of the 19th century start to invest also overseas. But unlike the British government, the French government and the German government, the Prussian government, 
were very, very open in uh, leading the negotiations of international loans on behalf of their local investors. Actually, the French government would sign these loans with foreign governments, and then they would go back to Paris, and then they would chip. I mean, they would split the loan among different merchant banks. So it, they were very, very open. And at some point, the British realized that that their investors are basically competing not against other investors, but they are competing against other governments, and that a lot of a big chunk of the British wealth is invested overseas. So you see the British government participating more and more often in either the negotiations of the loans, like in the case of, of, of China, or in the negotiations of default settlements, like in Egypt or the Ottoman Empire. So there is this also progressive change in foreign policy. And once you add those three things, loving capacity, elite replacement, and changing your strategic considerations, you have this basically growth in the bargaining power of foreign bondholders that allow them to actually execute this conditionality, uh, uh, like severe conditions that allow them to take over pledged assets in case of default. If the private lenders, private actors did not get that support, and you explained it really well, how the elite, the aristocratic elite were able to permeate, you know, the bureaucracy, or the office of the colonies or wherever, they were sitting on all sides of the table and they could influence this policy, which meant that, and this is going back to my question, so they were able to devise strategies, as I understand it, to offset that risk. I mean, I mean, the two things I read in your book, one is the so-called, you call extreme conditionalities, which has to do with high interest rates. And an interesting thing is here, all countries, including European and you know, non-European countries developed and developing were, if I haven't misunderstood you, they almost had to pay the same kind of high interest rates. So there was no differentiation, right? So that was one way that you could get back your money, charge a high interest rate. The second was you could actually take over certain assets during foreclosure, defaults. And the fascinating stories I read in your book has to do with bondholders taking over local tax administrations. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about these two strategies, the extreme conditionalities and what happened when there were defaults. Yeah, so the, the extreme conditionality is this practice of collateralizing specific public assets in order to access fresh capital with the understanding that in case of default, investors would be able to foreclose the, the, the collateral and run it until the debt was liquidated. And what I argue is that this helped us to explain why the interest rate, despite the many episodes of default in the 19th century, kept decreasing over time. That's, that's because the investors were compensating the risk of default by having access to the, the source of, of, of revenue overseas. Like railways and tobacco, et cetera, yes. right? So, yes, exactly. So they could either take possession of a branch of the tax administration and they would run like the excises of, of the tobacco sector or the customs office of international ports, or they could take over uh, state monopolies. I mean, again, this is the 19th century, so these were like the money cows of, of, the, of the developing world, like the tobacco monopoly in Bulgaria, the, uh, what else? Uh, I have a list uh, in El Salvador, they took over the, the railways, increased the salt, petroleum, cigarette paper, all these monopolies were run by foreign investors after, after the fault, and that's basically how they, they were able to to make money out of this uh, otherwise very risky business. And that's precisely why I argue that this early access to external capital was quite detrimental for long-term uh, state capacity in the developing world because these countries put their limited sources of revenue in the hands of private investors, right? And they lost their sovereignty, right? And I mean, they they, lost, there, yeah. there was interference. Yes. On a daily basis. Yes, but it's, I mean, it's even more problematic than, than that in the sense that they lost access to that tax base, those resources. So they, they had deficits again. And so they had to go back to international capital markets to, to fund that, right? To, to fund the yeah. deficit. And that, that's what created all these debt traps. And one, one thing that debt has is that it's very sticky, that it is very hard to, to, to liquidate debt. 
and that carries a very long, uh, a very lasting effect on, on the finances of, of countries. It sounds like the situation of certain countries at the moment as we speak, it isn't very different. But let's talk a little bit about some of the success stories. Not everything was bad. And in in the book, I read about Japan being a relative success story. We're talking about the late 1800s, early 1900s. Japan used the money, as you were saying, to modernize the military, buy weapons from mm-hmm. Europe, invested in infrastructure, agrarian reforms, reforms of the bureaucracy. But I see that what Japan did that many other countries didn't do, it did not just rely on external finance. It actually also supplemented it with domestic capital. Yes. And another success story is Chile and the role that economic elites played, right? So when push came to shove, they realized that in order to to really finance war, they had to, again, rely on domestic revenue. So help us understand these two cases, Japan and Chile, versus what you characterize in the book, not as successful, like Argentina, which is very wealthy until the start of World War II, and then debt just accumulated. It was like a runaway train. Mm -hmm. And Ethiopia on the African continent, which was a successful case in terms of resisting European colonization Mm -hmm. and was financing a lot of stuff domestically. And then it hasn't really worked out historically for Ethiopia in relation to poverty, et cetera. So mm-hmm. help us understand Japan, Chile, perhaps on one side and Argentina and Ethiopia on the other. I mean, the main takeaway, and I, and I hope this comes clear, is not is that the effect of external finance on state development is conditional on initial institutions. It's not that debt is good or that it is bad. The effect of debt is conditional on institutions. Now, as, as you mentioned, the statistical rarity that Japan had in the 19th century is that it had a pretty developed domestic capital market. And that allowed the country to keep spending external finance under control. So, for instance, they didn't allow the international investors to put their money in infrastructure. They only used the money to buy international weapons so that they didn't have the investors at home physically, right? And it worked out very well for them. At the same time, and and this is not me, this is economic historian Suzuki, who argues that at the end of the day, Japan was struggling to keep international investors at length and that they were basically lucky that, that the World War I happened because after World War I, the international markets collapsed and the years basically preceding World War I, you saw an increase, uh, an exponential increase in external finance in Japan, right? So, so they might have been saved by, by the belt. But the main takeaway here is that by having these domestic creditors, you can, you can basically reduce dependence, external dependence but at the same time, these external, these domestic debt uh, creditors have a lot of leverage on the domestic, uh, on, oh, sorry, on, on the local government. And that, that basically brings us back to the case of Chile and brings us back to what we've learned from uh, North Wangas Tasabach about public debt in, in Europe. That's basically the story that we, that we learned, that public debt was conducive to state building in, in Western Europe because the creditors of the government were also sitting in parliament. And if the sovereign decided to default or to use the monies for some meaningless end, they would basically depose the sovereign and and replace him or her uh, with someone else. And that's the strong, basically, political mechanism that domestic creditors have to discipline fiscal policy, right? And that was happening in, in Japan up to a point and that was happening in Chile up to a point. And those are the cases that are closest to the European path of state building. Now, in Chile, then, there has been a lot of discussion about economic historians, about the, what they call the parliamentary age, which is a time that follows the, the War of the Pacific, in which the, the, the parliament gains more power via the president. And they did that because they realized that the president uh, was basically 
accessing this pocket of money from the, everything that they extract, they basically confiscated from the south of Peru and, and Bolivia, and that the, he was accumulating too much power. And because of that, they implement these uh, constitutional reforms to empower the parliament and empower power-sharing institutions. And that's what I argue, that it's important to understand why Chile was able to make the most out of this source of, of money. Basically, in the same way that Norway benefited from oil, because it already had a strong political institution. That's correct. It, it wasn't, it, it was okay in, in a European sense. It wasn't yes. doing really badly. So it's it's easier. The same thing with China in, in recent years. You know, there were some investments in education and health that allowed it to build on economic growth. But uh, what about Ethiopia and Argentina? Argentina Dita? is what I call it the shadow case with of, of Japan. These are super different countries. And, and this is a, a little vignette that I have just to convey this message that initial institutions are important and that Argentina never developed domestic credit market. It always depended on British capital. And basically, by the end of the 19th century, it was a net exporter of capital to the UK. So a country that had gone through the various crisis, uh, varying crises was a net exporter to the lender country. And that's because they were uh, using half of the export revenue in repaying their debt. That's unsustainable. And, and basically, the sad story about Argentina is that it has never created that, that domestic credit market that made it more reliant sorry, more resilient to international crisis and uh, to basically the, some predator behavior by, by some foreign investors. And the case of, of Ethiopia is basically one which I bring in, in the book, like I do with Siam, to show that some incumbents were very aware of what the Europeans were doing in other countries. And Menelik uh, II was very aware of what was going on in Latin America and he saw that the Italians had like very obscure mot uh, motives to lend them money. He borrowed from them, but he paid back super fast because he didn't want to have to deal with that. And I think within two or three years, he paid everything back and he never raised any, any additional loan uh, because he understood the consequences of, of the faulting. So basically, he mobilized resources domestically and things were in a better uh, place when Hill Selassie took over his successor. And initially, he was pursuing the same policy of keeping international investors at arm's length. But eventually, in his later part of, uh, he, he stayed around for, for many decades, he switched strategy. And rather than depending on external debt, he started to rely on foreign aid. And you see foreign aid exploding. And at some point, he actually travels to Moscow and tells the Americans, if you don't give me money, I'm going to switch sides. And the Americans said, OK, OK, so now we're going to give you money. And basically, we have this standard story of the, of the uh, foreign aid course. Political scientists don't like to think of, of history in these terms. In terms, we like to think about institutions and things that we can measure, things that we can predict. But there is also this personal element that sometimes you have uh, more cautious than others, leaders that are more forward-looking than others. And Ethiopia is one, of, is one of these examples that you have basically the same dynasty, let's call it that way, in power. And the main elite was more cautious and didn't want to uh, expose the country to ex consequences of international intervention. And his successor started the same way, but gradually started to, to take more foreign aid. And as you mentioned earlier in this talk, once you have access to this pot of money overseas, it is very tempting to say no, uh, because it makes your life easier. It can increase in the short run your popularity. People can see that you can do things for them. The question is how you pay back and who pays back and when. So, so far, we've been discussing basically how this first period of globalization of finance managed to push countries into very different state building avenues or trajectories. And so some of the explanations you provided lead to even more questions. It's like, why weren't they more careful, the borrowers? And some of it is, of course, institutions, accountability structures, incentives, you mentioned them. Another set of issues would be why weren't the funds used more wisely? 
when once you did get money, you could have really, you know, invested wisely. Maybe it was because of polarization or instability, political instability. And then I mentioned earlier, you know, how one even today we tend to postpone all the problems that we have for the future. It's like we can't tackle them now. You know, we'll we'll address them later on, but it just becomes worse. Maybe that is um, the reason why many of these borrowers ended up pawning their assets. You know, maybe they did not have all the information. And then there was corruption. Oh, we yes. haven't really discussed this, right? I mean, there were some people who just benefited from, from this uh, because they, they could just mint money. So how would you bring all of this analysis to the current day to end where we started? What are the lessons out there for countries that are still very reliant on external assistance, external finance? This current phase of globalization of finance, what should we be looking out for? What are the lessons for countries today that you would highlight from that historical analysis that you've undertaken? <laughs> well, so let, let me just clarify that. I, I consider that like the sco- like the scope conditions of of the book are different from what they are today. That nowadays these countries are negotiating against international organizations most of the time. Uh, so there is a terrific book by Jonas Bunte, who sizes the the share of purely private lending today in eleven percent touch points of the of the total pie, uh, whereas in the nineteenth century it was ninety nine percent. So I think that I, I began by saying that I think that now borrowers are in better hands than they were in the past. I, and, and I think that the answer is, again, conditionality. The answer is to make sure that loans are conditioned not only to basically in transparency, they are also conditioned to capacity building. So I think that every loan, every developmental loan should be linked to improvements in legibility to make sure that countries are investing in their capacity to mobilize revenue, mobilize domestic revenue. And also they should try to promote more participation of the the non-elites in, I mean, the the general public. So the more individuals, yes. Transparency, more consultation. People understand that this money is not for free, that this money has to be paid, even if if this is a soft loan, uh, soft loan, but Still, the principal has to be paid back, right? They they have to understand it. it. It has to be, there has to be a way in which rulers cannot play this game of okay. So I'm going to use these funds. I'm going to buy these bridges. It's going to be super flashy. Then election comes. I win with a like 80 percent. No, that cannot happen. And and we need to be aware of that. And that's why I mean, there has to be more information. That we need to make sure. The relevant players understand where the money comes from, what it implies for the future, for the budget, ten years from now. But Dirac, I have to say here, I've, I've asked this question to many policymakers, including elected leaders, and their response is that if we do this, if we do this kind of a referendum kind of consultation, we'll never be able to make these bold decisions to invest. So it is up to us, the elected leaders or whoever's in power, to make this on behalf of the people, because the people can't agree. And I understand. I mean, we, we don't pass taxes based on referendum. So somebody has to make the decisions. And that's why we believe in, in representative institutions. It's more about informing people ab- about what's going on. And, and mm-hmm. I mean, I, I know that like more people, most people want, I mean, not even in the States or in Europe, people understand what international finance is, but like the relevant players, like the political parties, the business organizations, the trade unions, mm. these are the, the, the organizations that have to be very aware of what the conditions of these loans are and how the loans are spent and in what they are spent, right? So that's that's what I think is, is, is fundamental to try to make this funding as non-zero-sum game, which the country benefits, but at the same time it empowers the relevant social a- actors to hold the ruler accountable and that they can basically prevent rulers from making flash investments of things that might not be the uh, priority for, for the country. And that plus investing in capacity. Didak, it was lovely to see you. Thanks for a lovely conversation and for coming on my show today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.
If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo. Please email your questions, comments and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.